My name is Kent Blackhurst, and I'm a member of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Although I'm going to be using the scriptures and quoting from some of the prophets, I'm not doing this representing the church. I am, however, following the admonition of Dallin H. Oaks, who said in the April 2004 General Conference, While we are powerless to alter the fact of the second coming and unable to know its exact time, we can accelerate our own preparation and try to influence the preparation of those around us. It's in that spirit that I'd like to share some of the insights that I've discovered from my studies of the signs that lead up to the second coming. As we approach this subject, I want to stress that anyone who prayerfully studies the scriptures can know for themselves the approximate time of the second coming. And even though we can't know the exact time of the Lord's coming, we can come pretty close. How close can we really get? I'll attempt to answer that over this video series of Fasten Your Seatbelts for the Second Coming. On this first portion of my video, we'll learn that we are the generation that will usher in the Second Coming, as things have already started. In my next segments, we'll cover more of the signs and fulfilled prophecies that point to this. After this, there are eight other modules that cover subjects related to the Second Advent of the Savior. I recommend that you watch them sequentially because the information builds upon itself and I want you to fully understand the material I share later. So with that said, Module 2 covers how we can determine that the sixth seal has passed away and been completely fulfilled. In Module 3, we'll discuss the signs of the heavens which correspond to the religious events and which foreshadow how close we are to Christ's return to the earth. Module 4 addresses how the first four angels of the seventh seal have already begun to sound their trumps. We will also talk about between now and when the three woes will begin, and when Adam, the Ancient of Days, will go to Adam on Diamond and turn leadership over to the Savior. Module 6 covers promised blessings of Israel, and we'll look at Israel's history leading up till today in preparation for the Messiah's return. In Module 7, We'll cover the mission of the two witnesses in Jerusalem for the three and a half years before the Lord's coming to the Jews. In part eight, we'll cover the topic of Zion, the different definitions and the importance that plays in the second coming of Christ. Lastly, module nine covers seven major long prophesied and life-changing events that will occur between Christ's coming to the Mount of Olives and his final coming when he'll officially reign king of kings. Now, before I start covering this topic, I realize that there are people who might see things a little differently regarding this. There are some who say that we are in the sixth seal, while others say that we're in the seventh seal, and each person has their own reasons for concluding what they have. A lesson on how God's words are often fulfilled differently than how we imagine or even hope they would be was recently reinforced through the death of my father. My dad, being one month away from turning 90, suffered from several ailments, and one of his sons was asked to give him a blessing, wherein I thought might include permission to cross over to the other side, because no one wanted to see him suffer more. Yet, the blessing stated that he would be healed of the symptoms he was bearing and that it wasn't quite time for him to pass over because there were things he still needed to do for his family in order to complete his mission. He was immediately healed of some of the vexing symptoms he was experiencing and after the blessing some family members concluded that since he was healed of those symptoms that it would mean that he'd soon regain his strength for a season more before he'd pass. Others felt that it was time for out-of-town family members to come and say goodbye. Now, both interpretations could have been correct. Both conclusions revealed faith in the blessing. But God had his plan of how things should work out. Through the blessing, things weren't spelled out completely. It didn't pronounce that now was the time for family members to come and say goodbye. This might have been too difficult for both him and other members of the family to hear, as many were not ready to accept that at that point. Yet, over the next few days, 
his children and grandchildren were able to come to his bedside and say goodbye or call in order to feel closure. On Sunday afternoon, two of the sons who wouldn't be able to come until the following day were able to have separate private calls over FaceTime. The Spirit whispered to me after these were done that it was now time for him to pass over. So I went into his room expecting him to die at any moment. Well, he persisted another hour or so and I couldn't understand why he hadn't passed to the other side when the Spirit had indicated that it was time and when all that had to say something to him had that opportunity. I offered a silent prayer and the Spirit then whispered to me that my dad felt he still needed to hang on due to the blessing that he'd received. He just didn't feel like it was his time as there were responsibilities that I knew he didn't want to relinquish. As soon as I had that inspiration, I put my hand on top of his and whispered, Dad, it's okay. You have now completed your mission upon the earth. It's okay to cross over. He then took two more breaths and his spirit left his body. I had expected to feel horrible at his passing. And yet, I was filled with peace, the peace borne by the Spirit, that he was simply transferring on to the next stage of his progression. The thing that I'd expected to be bitter tasted sweet. Now, how does this relate to the second coming? Well, we all have the scriptures explaining things to happen before the great and dreadful day of the Christ's return. We can all speculate, but we can also each receive God's interpretation if we but ask with an open mind and are ready to accept whatever is given to us. Where peace has been taken from the earth conveys atrocities for many, yet it can still be peaceful for those who are in tune with the Spirit, knowing that all will work out for those who understand the promised blessings that await the world. So, no matter the tribulations the world passes through, we can be ready. And no matter the confusion in the world surrounding the events of the Second Coming and recognizing the signs, they can be revealed to us if we but study and ask. In other words, those who are ready to receive instruction of the Lord can receive it. They can know for themselves if the signs we are witnessing are the signs indicating that Christ is hastening his work or not. They can know if we are that generation, even if the exact day of his coming is not known to anyone. How can we know if we are the generation that shall see all of these things fulfilled, of which every prophet, including the Savior himself, foretold? In Matthew, we read, Now learn of a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So as we see these things happening, the Lord promised that this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. With that, most members assume that since they can't know the day or the time, then they don't have to study the signs. And then they go on with their daily lives because there seems to be so many other worries to think about. I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, that if you've been a little bit apathetic, that you'll see the need to hasten your preparation efforts. I believe that we are indeed living in the seventh seal just prior to the coming of the Lord. We were reserved to live on earth now so that we could live up to the tasks that we were foreordained to perform. In 2020 and 2021, like no previous years, we've witnessed the Lord's voice speaking through thunders and lightnings, fires and pestilences so that the world might turn to him. Last year was the most active hurricane season on record. There were earthquakes and several other natural disasters. Elder Rasband in the 2020 conference said, We live in that time prophesied. We are the people charged with ushering in 
the second coming of Jesus Christ, we are to gather God's children, those who will hear and embrace the truths, covenants, and promises of the everlasting gospel. President Nelson calls it the greatest challenge, the greatest cause, and the greatest work on the earth today. Of that miracle, I bear my witness. There we have it. He didn't say some of us will at some future date. He simply said, we are the people charged with ushering in the second coming. And we are now living in fulfillment of all the prophet's visions of our day, unquote. As the Savior said, all things will be fulfilled before this generation passes away. If we have faith that Elder Rasband is a prophet, seer, and rev leader, as one of the twelve apostles, we can know that we are the people. But we should also know that we are the generation preparing the world for the Lord's second advent. This entire presentation demonstrates that we are living in that time period now. But that doesn't mean that the second coming is within a year or two, yet just how long is a generation in the Lord's time? Well, in Matthew 1, it talks about 14 generations between Abraham and David, and another 14 generations from David to the carrying away of the Israelites into Babylonian captivity. Then, there were an additional 14 generations from that till the birth of Christ. So every 14 generation equals 490 years of time. Divide 490 by 14, and you get 35 years. So here we have it, our first clue that 35 years is one possible time frame that marks the beginning of a new generation. In fact, during most of Earth's history, since Noah anyway, a generation would pass away within 35 years on average. With that said, we can now consider other meanings of a generation as well. For example, a generation could also be considered the collective likely life expectancy of those living at a certain point of human history. When the Savior visited the Nephites, nine of his disciples asked that after arriving at the age of a man, that they might speedily come up to live with Christ in his kingdom. The Savior then promised them that after they arrived at the age of 72, they would die and be taken up to dwell with him. The life expectancy of people in the 18th and 19th century might only have been around 35 years of age. Although there were people living to their 70s or 80s, most had passed away beforehand. 30%, in fact, died before their first birthday. However, with improvements in medications and improved access to drinking water and medical care, many might now expect to live into their 90s or even past 100. There are currently over a half million centenarians living throughout the world. Another definition of a generation could be those living during a particular time period. For example, we speak of those living in the time of the Greek or Roman empires, the Dark Ages, or the time of Christ. Currently, we speak of those who were born in the greatest generation, the silent generation, the baby boomers, generation X, the millennials, or generation Z. The Lord also spoke of the state of people living during a certain generation as being righteous or wicked. For example, the Savior said that it was a wicked and an adulterous generation that would seek for a sign. He also said that in the generation where the signs of the second coming would be shown, that that generation would not all pass away until all things were fulfilled. I have completed my 60th year of life, and I remember hearing from my youth that the signs of the times were literally being fulfilled. I believed the prophets then, and I believe the prophets today. Many who were born around the time that I was born will still be around for the Lord's final coming to earth. And yet, there is still so much that is to happen between now and then. While I was serving on my mission back in 1981, then Elder Ezra Taft Benson gave a devotional at BYU. Now keep in mind that this was 40 years ago. He said the following. Every generation, I suppose, sees the time in which they live as being exceptional. The truth of the matter is, you do live in a most exceptional time in the history of mankind. You young people will see events transpire which were promised from the beginning of the world. 
Prophets of old have seen your days and rejoiced in them, and yet you will face challenges and circumstances, the severity of which has been unparalleled in generations past. For this, you must be prepared. I see this prophecy as being in the process of its complete fulfillment. There is yet more to come, but I believe that it is this generation that shall not pass away before all these things are fulfilled and when the Lord will come again. Why is it important to know that we are the prophesied generation? Well, it's so that we might be prepared. Let me illustrate. About 50 years ago, President Kimball stated just why preparation is so important. In speaking about the second coming and taking the world by surprise, he wrote in his book, Faith Precedes a Miracle, the following. With no warning, no last minute preparation is possible. Unquote. I interpret that, that there probably won't be any general warnings from the prophet to the membership of the church, that God's angels have started to sound their trumps. So hurry, the wedding party is taking place in the next year or two or three, for example. They won't be that specific because this is our test to see if we will be obedient while the world seems to be imploding around us. He then explained a parable, quote, He, Christ, gave us another parable to try to make clear the importance of being always prepared. It is the parable of the ten virgins, a powerful warning to all men. All the virgins, wise and foolish, had accepted the invitation to the wedding supper. They had knowledge of the program and had been warned of the important day to come. Half of them found their lamps empty. They had cheated themselves. They were fools, these five unprepared virgins. Apparently, the bridegroom had tarried for reasons that were sufficient and good. Time had passed, and he had not come. They had heard of this coming for so long, for so many times, that the statement seemingly became meaningless to them. Hundreds of thousands of us today are in this position. Confidence has been dulled and patience worn thin. Well, 50 years ago, that number was hundreds of thousands. But today, that number would be in the millions of members of the church. At midnight, the vital cry was made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Even the foolish virgins trim their lamps. Unquote. We've been commanded to prepare ourselves temporally, emotionally, and spiritually. And like the people in the days of Noah, Many members have become pacified into some sense of security, and this lack of warning is designed to weed out the tares from the wheat. The all as well in Zion members are the foolish whom President Kimball talked about. They don't realize that there is little time left for preparation, and so they allow themselves to get swept up into the cares of the world and forget our main mission, that is to prepare the world for the coming of the Lord. Now, there are many, even strong members of the church, who sincerely believe that the sixth seal hasn't even ended yet. Perhaps they don't fully understand that the scriptures teach that each seal represents another thousand-year period, or they don't comprehend how the scriptures have been fulfilled regarding the sixth seal time frame. This time period was not supposed to be so obvious that the casual observer would understand. This is a time frame where we were meant to exercise our faith and ask that the windows of heaven might be open to our understanding. This can't come from merely attending church either. This only comes by prayerfully searching the scriptures at home and asking to receive greater knowledge. Using the quote from Spencer W. Kimball, the prophet, he stated that with no warning, no last minute preparation is possible. And if we listen to what our current prophet is saying, that time is running out and the road ahead is going to be bumpy, or we are living in the time long since prophesied, we need not expect more counsel. How else is the Lord going to test our faith and distinguish the wheat from the tares? There are simply times the Lord directs his prophets to not reveal every single thing they've received. 
Instead, he will inspire them to counsel us to read all the passages about Christ's mission or regarding the blessings of Israel. These studies lead us individually to prepare for that which will shortly come to pass. When else has the Lord explicitly prevented prophets from divulging things revealed to only a few? Well, there's various examples from the scriptures, but I'll share one from the Book of Mormon. In 3 Nephi 26, 11 through 12, it says, And if it so be that they will not believe these things, then shall the greater things be withheld from them unto their condemnation. Behold, I was about to write them, all which were engraven upon the plates of Nephi, but the Lord forbade it, saying, I will try the faith of my people. Therefore, I, Mormon, do write the things which have been commanded of me of the Lord. And now I, Mormon, make an end of my sayings and proceed to write the things which have been commanded me. This is why we need to make sure we're studying the scriptures and seeking the guidance of the Holy Ghost, and why we must always rely on the Savior's grace as we strive to keep the commandments as best as we can. Some ambiguities and vague references may not be revealed to the whole, but only because they seek not and ask not, but they certainly can be divulged to those who worthily ask and seek to understand the mysteries of God. With that said, we were living in the 11th hour when the church was organized, and we know this because in October of 1830, a revelation given to the prophet Joseph Smith in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 33, states, For behold, the field is white and all ready to harvest, and it is the 11th hour, and the last time that I shall call laborers into my vineyard. This alludes to a couple of parables. The first is of the ten virgins, because it is in that last hour that the virgins start to assemble in anticipation for the coming of the bridegroom. However, that was 191 years ago. So in the Lord's timeline, that's roughly four and a half hours ago. So it truly seems that time has passed. Many expect that we ought to be just at a minute before midnight, but in reality it's probably already past 2.30 in the morning, a time one might expect a thief in the night. Remember, in the parable of the ten virgins, the bridegroom came late. For some reason he was held up and only half of the members of the party, translated to being members of the church, were ready to attend the feast with him. Well, perhaps they were all friends of the bride, because when they did come to the door and the groom answered, he said he didn't know them and that they couldn't come. This scripture also complements the parable of the 11th hour, where those working in the last hour would be compensated the same wage as those who worked in dispensations past. Or if a latecomer to Christ, they could be compensated with the same wages as those who worked throughout their entire lives. The 11th hour in Hebrew doesn't refer to 11 p.m. It refers to the time between 5 and 6 p.m. or the end of the working day, which started at 6 a.m., by the way. So the symbolism represents those who are called to labor in the very last hour or the last dispensation, the final time before Christ's blessings and judgments come forth upon all, when the house of Israel will finally be gathered in and their promised blessings will finally be realized as Christ finally reigns King of Kings. There's so much confusion that I've seen between this last hour, the sixth seal, the seventh seal, and how they all relate to the second coming that I felt I should share some of the things that have helped me to make it more clear. First off, the Savior doesn't return to the earth as soon as the seventh seal begins. It never was prophesied to be so. We talk about how Christ will reign for a thousand years, and so that is why some feel that he has to come right then at the start of the next thousand year period. Perhaps this is another reason why some mistakenly believe that the sixth seal has not ended yet and that Christ will come as soon as it does. 
Well, if you are prayerful and study all of the scriptures on Christ's coming, I believe that the Spirit can confirm to your soul where we currently are. After the seventh seal opens, there are a number of things that have to happen before Christ's visit to Adam on Diamon, and then at his coming to save the Jews in Jerusalem at the Battle of Armageddon. This is an exciting time because things spoken of by prophets for thousands of years are just now coming to fruition. So please don't doubt your testimony since it's been 191 years since the restoration and that the time must have already passed. Again, what I hope to impress upon you, that like it or not, or agree or disagree, we are that generation. So as I've studied the prophecies of the events leading up to the second coming, the best way I've found to outline the order of the Latter-day events is to compare the various scriptures of the same topic together. Read them in order and then put them on a spreadsheet where each passage coincides. This is pretty easy to do with a gospel library online or downloaded to your phone or tablet. Most chapters or sections of scripture put these happenings in chronological order within the scene that each prophet is writing about at that time. So when you compare and match each revelation, you're putting together a scriptural puzzle that fits each piece together in order to create the full picture when events are likely to occur and when they already have been fulfilled. What you see here is an example of a method that I've used to try and piece together a harmonious scriptural puzzle from the events of the last days. These are just four of the several scriptures that I pieced together talking about the signs of the time. For an even greater panoramic view, I could be looking at other sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, the writings in Matthew 24 and 25, the visions of Daniel, Joel, Isaiah, the writings of Paul and Peter, along with the visions of Nephi, Jacob, Helaman, Mormon, and Moroni. There are so many scriptures that cover the last days, and yet we often gloss over them because they're a bit intimidating although they are plainly written to those who grasp the symbolism and meanings of these references. Yet, with practice, it becomes easier to grasp them. Here, you'll see how I've lined up certain events with just four separate scriptures relating to the Second Coming. I've color-coded points that reference the same incident so that I might construct a chronological order for everything. For example, here, you'll see that after the world rejects the gospel and after the first half hour of silence, that when the Lord will speak with increased voices of thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. Now, in section 45, it also adds another detail that is introduced about this time. It is speaking about an overflowing sickness or scourge, while section 133 of the Doctrine and Covenants doesn't include anything about this sequence of events in its narrative, but it coincides chronologically and contributes new details on other happenings. The other thing we learn from this is that these things continue to happen after the 7,000 years has begun. And if we look at the statistics from the past 20 years, these natural disasters have increased exponentially. Let's look at the two one-half hour periods of silence. So as we put these passages in chronological order, we realize that the silence in heaven spoken of about on the top under Revelation 8.14 doesn't fit into the same sequential order of the silence in heaven spoken about in section 88. So you then have to ask whether or not these things are mixed out of order in each timeline or are they just two separate events? Well, by doing this, I learned that these are two separate half hours of silence because each chapter or section is following its own sequential flow. They just wouldn't line up correctly otherwise. In Revelation 8, 1, it says, And when I had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in the heaven for about the space of a half an hour. Now, to determine if these refer to the same half hour of silence, we need to read each scripture in its context. In Revelation, John spoke of what was going to happen 
after the seventh dispensation began or after the seventh seal is opened. First, he spoke of the prayers of the saints or members of the church pleading for deliverance from the wickedness of the world. The seven angels had been waiting to sound their trumps for a long time now. So the seventh seal opens and there's silence in the heavens for the space of half an hour. This doesn't mean that there won't be revelation coming from heaven during this half hour. If that were the case, he would have said that the heavens would be shut for the space of a half an hour. What he meant was that the destroying angels had been holding back before God's judgments would be leashed out upon the world. For in verse 5, we get the main clue of what this half hour of silence meant. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar. Now the censer, of course, represents the prayers of the saints. And he cast it unto the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So after this first half hour of silence, voices of thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes would occur. Now, this was fulfilled by looking at the year 2020. There were more floods, hurricanes, lightning striking the earth, causing fires than in any other year on record. In the Doctrine and Covenants, section 8895, it also speaks of a half an hour of silence. And there shall be silence in the heaven for the space of a half an hour. And immediately after shall the curtain of heaven be unfolded as a scroll is unfolded after it is rolled up. And the face of the Lord shall be unveiled. In this case, it talks about the half an hour to occur just prior to the Lord revealing his face. The first half hour of silence spoke of thunderings and lightnings following it, while the second speaks of an appearance of Christ. Let's further examine the context of section 88. Just prior to this verse, it says, And another angel shall sound his trump, saying, that great church, the mother of abominations, that made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, that persecuteth the saints of God, that shed their blood, she who sitteth upon the many waters and upon the islands of the sea, behold, she is the tares of the earth. She is bound in bundles. Her bands are made strong. No man can loose them, Therefore, she is ready to be burned, and he shall sound his trump both long and loud, and all nations shall hear it. When would the great and abominable church be tied in bundles? As we think about it, wouldn't it be likely that this could occur at the time Christ appears to the Jews on the Mount of Olives? This would be the turning point for the world to learn that Jesus was and is the true Messiah. This would cause the great and abominable church with all of its offshoots to finally be bound so that rational people would no longer give heed to its teachings. So it is after this event that the second one half hour of silence would begin prior to the Savior's final coming. Now the question, scripturally, is one half hour speaking according to man's reckoning? or according to the Lord's reckoning. Remember, in 2 Peter it says that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So as we do the math, one half hour over a thousand year period equals 20.8 years. That brings us to about now. With this timeline matching the warning signs in the heavens, which I'll talk about shortly in another segment, I feel pretty confident that the true meaning of the half an hour that John spoke about is around 20.8 years, or according to the reckoning of the Lord's time. I'm going to pull out the date of April 6, 2000 as to when the seventh seal opened. And if you're interested, I've included in the series the complete fulfillment of the sixth seal, where I'll explain why this date seems to match that timeline. 20.8 years brings us to December 21st, 2020. A compelling reason to select this date is that it also coincides with what some refer to as the sign of Christ or the Christmas star. According to NASA, 
Jupiter and Saturn align with one another every 20 years or so. But they've rarely been as close together as they were on December 21st, 2020. Perhaps one other time noted would have taken place on April 6th, 6 BC. Could this have been the true birth date of the Savior? This Christmas star is an example of a constellation sign. Please note that John said silence in the heaven about the space of a half an hour. So you should be able to see how the silence ended by looking at all things that happened in 2020. Either way, whether or not the half hour of silence after the seventh seal opened is being reckoned by our earthly time or as to the figuring of the Lord's time by Peter, we know one thing, the time has already passed. And there are many attestations of signs and events that are happening in fulfillment of the scripture and many more that will shortly occur. I bring this up here to demonstrate that we are indeed living in exciting times, yet often it's hard to determine exactly where we are currently standing amongst the fulfillment of all the prophecies from the scriptures. In Romans 9.28 and in the Doctrine and Covenants section 52.11, we're told that Christ will cut short his work in righteousness. And in the Doctrine and Covenants 84.97, it says, And plagues shall go forth, and they shall not be taken from the earth until I have completed my work, which shall be cut short in righteousness. When we as a people are prepared, the Lord can expedite or hasten his coming. So perhaps the reason the half an hour of silence could be calculated according to our reckoning or to the Lord's is really dependent upon our readiness to meet him. With all the signs and scriptures regarding the second coming, it doesn't come down to how wicked the world is. I think we can all agree that it's wicked enough. But rather, we need to ask ourselves, how righteous are we as members of Christ's church? Are we Zion-like enough? Do we have pure hearts and clean hands? Are we of one heart? Are our hearts lined up with the will of God? To think that the second coming is dependent upon our overall goodness is quite the burden to carry. Is our collective goodness enough to justify the Lord in cutting his timeline down? I can't think of times when God's timeline has been shortened, but I can think of times when it's been lengthened before he could bless his adherents. So what are some of these examples from the scriptures when timelines were altered due to the fact that his people were not truly prepared to meet the Lord's requirements of faith and obedience? Well, in Numbers, it talks about the 12 scouts that went to scope out the promised land so that they might settle there. The problem was that it was already inhabited. 10 of these scouts came back saying that they wouldn't be wise to move there due to the size of the population. And they convinced the majority of Israelites that their chances of prevailing in an invasion were pretty slim. Well, since Joshua and Caleb were the only two who had faith that the Lord could work a miracle and they were unable to change the minds of the majority, Israel's promised blessing of going to the promised land was delayed. It was never taken away, but because of this lack of faith, the timeline became lengthened so that they had to wait an additional 40 years of living on manna and looking upon a serpent staff in order to be healed from snake bites before the Israelites could develop the needed faith to inhabit their promised land. More recently, we're still waiting for Jackson County to become the center stake of Zion. This promise was never taken away, yet we're still waiting for its fulfillment. So is the church righteous enough yet for this prophecy to come to pass? I'll go into more detail later in another segment regarding Zion. For now, understanding that we can't know the mind of the Lord for the exact timing, but knowing that it has a lot to do with how good we are in order to be ready to receive him is a good start. So in the meantime, we need to pay attention to the signs and read and compare scripture verses together to understand where we are now and what needs to happen still before Christ returns. And there is so much yet to transpire. This is an outline of the order of events that have to happen leading up to Christ's coming 
just to the Mount of Olives. Now, everything in Burgundy red has already occurred or is also continuing in the process of being completed. Throughout this video series, we'll work through many of these things so that you can see that 2021 in bright red comes after the half an hour of silence has ended and after the fourth angel in Revelation 8, 12, and 13 has sounded. We are still awaiting the three woes. What you see in blue represents all that is yet to happen between now and the coming of the Savior to the Mount of Olives and some of his other appearances to the world before his final coming and glory to all the world. And as you can see in dark blue, there are still several things that have to happen between the Savior's return to the Mount of Olives and his final coming to all the world when he's dressed in his red apparel. Now, I've heard people say that because the scriptures say that the Lord will come as a thief in the night, that the entire world will be surprised. In fact, no one can really know because the scriptures say that even the angels in heaven don't know. And if anyone says that they know the day, that you should run as fast as you can in the other direction. Well, statements like that keep people from even trying to recognize the signs that the Lord has given. True, we may not know the exact day and time, but we can know the approximate day. So let's continue to read the scriptures. As children of light, that day will not be a surprise to us at all. In fact, in verse 5 of Doctrine and Covenants 106, it says, Therefore, gird up your loins, that ye may be the children of light, and that day shall not overtake you as a thief. Thus, if we are living in the light, we won't at all be surprised when he does come. We will have been expecting it, so he doesn't come to us as a thief in the night. In fact, by studying the signs, we can better find peace, and our testimonies will be strengthened because we will understand that all this chaos has a divine purpose, and it will end in a great climax. And as we recognize these signs when they are given, we have a promise, as seen in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 through 6, it states, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. I take that to mean that the righteous will know by the signs given when his second coming is about to happen. True, the exact day or hour of the Savior's return may not be known to us, but we will know the approximate day just as when a woman goes into labor. We know her baby will be born soon. In fact, when my wife went into labor with our firstborn, we had the due date, which came and went, by the way, and so we did everything possible to encourage the onset of labor. Why was this taking so long? We took long walks. We went on car rides where I purposely went over every pothole in the neighborhood, hoping that a bumpy car ride would somehow induce labor. In retrospect, that wasn't such a good idea, unless you too want to pay to replace your struts. I think my wife even took some cod liver oil. Ugh. We prayed and prayed for seven days that our baby daughter might arrive that night. As to us, the due date had passed. But it began to feel like a vain repetition. Finally, a week after the due date, my wife was in labor. I remember looking up at the clock, and it was 6 p.m., and I wondered if our daughter would be born before midnight or if she'd come the next morning. Well, midnight did come and go, and yet I knew that our daughter would be born soon as my wife's labor continued to progress. Then at 2.37 a.m., our daughter was born. I hadn't beforehand known the exact day or hour she'd come. Not even the doctors or the nurses knew that. I suppose only Heavenly Father could have known the exact time but the important thing is that she came and we knew the approximate hour of her birth because the signs indicated just that. I believe that the second coming will come in most of our lifetimes. By the time you prayerfully watch the rest of this video series, I think you'll concur. 
And now more than any other time, we must prepare. As every prophet from Joseph Smith on has quoted DNC 3830, for if ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. I tend to believe them. The Lord will protect us and our families if we're obedient. That is his promise, not mine. Yet that doesn't mean we're not going to have a bumpy road ahead, nor that there might be a few casualties among the righteous along the way. Most can sense that things are accelerating. And I think that we'll see that if we continue to follow the prophet, that we'll be protected no matter what may befall the world. In speaking of the latter days, Christ said in the Doctrine and Covenants 97, 23 through 26, the Lord's scourge shall pass over by night and by day, and the report thereof shall vex all people. Yea, it shall not be stayed until the Lord come, for the indignation of the Lord is kindled against their abominations and all their wicked works. Nevertheless, Zion shall escape if she observe to do all things whatsoever I have commanded her. But if she observe not to do whatsoever I have commanded her, I will visit her according to her works, with sore affliction, with pestilence, with plague, with sword, with vengeance, with devouring fire. There will continue to be some of the righteous who are affected, but for the most part, the greater majority will be spared if we are worthy and follow the advice and counsel of the First Presidency. It also brings me peace that for those righteous saints who are affected by some of these bad things coming upon us, they'll still be happily received on the other side, pressed against the Lord's bosom. So it is up to us to follow the living prophet now more than ever. What we see him do, we should follow. What he asks us to do, we should obey. Let's not say that the prophet is just speaking as an administrator. The test is whether we'll use our reasoning against the Lord's directives. It's a question of faith and obedience to follow the prophet, for he is the Lord's mouthpiece today. Even if we feel we have some inside information that he doesn't, chances are more likely that he has inside information that we don't. Therein, we will find safety, no matter the sophistry that the world dictates. I see our time period as the moment the Lord is dividing the wheat from among the tares. Now, as I've correlated the scriptures regarding the second coming, I've noticed the events create a chiasmus or a chiasm culminating in Christ's glory and the celestial glory of the planet that we live on. Chiasmus is a Hebraic form of scripture writing using symmetry and how the events or a train of thought unfolds. The following chiasm covers events of the sixth seal up and through the millennium and on to when the earth becomes a celestial sphere. Now, please follow along. Satan's darkness covered the world. The sun and the moon darkened while the falling stars hurled. A stone cut without hands brought forth the kingdom of God to help us hold fast to the iron rod. Yet as wickedness would not relent, warnings of thunderings and lightnings were sent. Thus came forth pestilences, wars, and destruction, so that man might recognize his corruption. Amidst all the devastation, Jerusalem's third temple is planned, a wondrous contemplation, and Christ's two witnesses cry repentance to the world as his gospel's majesty is preached unfurled. Yet men repent not, and with greed they do plot the Jewish annihilation. Then a quake shakes every nation, bringing forth great devastation. Christ then rescues Judah from the mount for all the world to recount. All hail to Christ our King, while his angelic chorus doth sing, Hosanna. Many angry men yet remain, and so God's name they still profane. Woe to their evil contemplation, but amidst all of this, there comes great bliss. Missionaries from the Jews come forth to gather all people from the south and unto the north to preach of their long-awaited Messiah, who will yet rule thenceforth and minister to every nation. Meanwhile, the city of New Jerusalem's temple opens henceforth 
a marvelous manifestation, Zion's foremost compensation. And upon the Savior's return, all the remaining wicked will burn. For God's tender mercies they did spurn. They only feel shame while being consumed by flame. Now only doth righteousness prevail as eternal laws all unveil as Christ governs at the helm. With boundless light covering his realm, the sun and moon and every star will appear darkened from afar. For as this world becomes a celestial globe, all wisdom, knowledge, and light emanate from God's robe. And all knowledge, wisdom, and truth are made of will, for Christ's light, glory, and power prevail. Christ's plan, which Satan tried to derail, now turns men into gods, perfect in every detail. To review, on this first portion of Fasten Your Seatbelts for the Second Coming, we've learned that 1. We are the generation that will usher in the second coming as things have already started and the fig leaves have sprouted. In my next segments, we'll cover more of the signs and fulfill prophecies that point to this. We've also learned, number two, that a generation is usually about the span of 35 years, but for a generation to pass away, it would depend on the current lifespan of those living in that generation. It could be likely up to a hundred years, depending on our collective preparedness. The Lord's time flying can be cut short in righteousness, but that depends upon us living as a Zion-like society. So are we spiritually ready? Do we recognize the voice of the Lord? And do we hear and follow it as we know we should? We will know about when to expect the Lord's coming by the signs given so that it doesn't overtake us as a thief in the night or as an unprepared servant of the master's house. And if we are prepared, we'll be protected from most of the calamities as long as we are living righteously. And if this is the case, we need not fear. Lastly, number six, God's plan uses perfect symmetry in its execution. There is much yet to happen, but every promise will be fulfilled before this generation passes away. May we all prepare ourselves better, for we are the promised generation that every prophet has seen in vision. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This ends the first segment of Fasten Your Seatbelts for the Second Coming. Now we have a base so that we can delve deeper into this fantastic and fascinating topic.